Welcome everyone to this edition of the Doorstep Podcast. I'm your co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Nick Vozdev. Uh, my other co-host, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Council, Tatiana Serafin, uh, is unable to make uh, this recording today, uh, but uh, we will continue with our guest uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we'll be bringing on uh, to discuss uh, changing dynamics in West Asia, the Middle East, uh, the reorientation of India westward and of Israel and the Emirates eastward, uh, and what those would mean for us uh, in the uh, United States, what some of the doorstep implications would be with uh, Mohammed Solomon, who is a global strategy advisor and a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute. And you can follow him at Twitter at, at this is Solomon. But before we bring uh, Mohammed on, uh, normally this is uh, where we look at some of what has been happening in the news uh, as we move forward. Uh, and a couple of items uh, of interest uh, as they have been uh, developing. Uh, we are still dealing with uh, the aftermath uh, of Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan with uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, continuing some of its uh, military exercises, uh, which have the uh, added impact of disrupting or delaying uh, trade flows, because areas that uh, where exercises are taking place uh, are closed to uh, traffic. So when we've had Peter Sands on uh, a few weeks earlier talking about uh, the ways in which delays in global supply chains can begin to stock up uh, and stack up, uh, this is a reminder that even without any overt use of force, uh, China can signal uh, its displeasure with the speaker's visit uh, to the island uh, by uh, creating some economic difficulty. Uh, and this again points to uh, the importance of supply chains, but also the importance of alternatives, developing alternatives. And some of that will come out in our conversation uh, in a few minutes. Uh, with, with Mohammed. Uh, we are dealing with uh, the potential re-eruption of conflict uh, in uh, the Caucasus, uh, despite a ceasefire in place between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, there have been a uh, resumption of some military activity, points to the fact that uh, as the Russian invasion of Ukraine continues, and as our attention focuses more on what happens there, uh, we have seen uh, in the last few months that conflicts that were tapped down elsewhere, people and governments are taking advantage of all focus, all eyes on what's happening in Ukraine uh, to try to change their uh, position on the battlefield, to improve their uh, position uh, on the, uh, at the negotiating table. Uh, and so we've seen an uptick in violence, not just in the Caucasus, but around the world, uh, which is worrying. And again, something that uh, we'll discuss in our conversation with Mohammed, uh, the ability or inability of the United States to be able to focus on multiple problems at the same time uh, and what this might have. Finally, uh, we, of course, at the doorstep are very interested uh, in uh, continuing to track uh, the most key doorstep issues, including uh, what's happening in terms of uh, prices, prices at the grocery store, prices at the pump. Uh, and so far, uh, the Biden administration appears to uh, be moving ahead uh, with plans to continue to distribute uh, and sell oil from the strategic reserve. Uh, and finally, uh, within the factions within the Democratic Party, uh, agreement was reached, and we have seen passage uh, of a major piece of legislation that has implications for energy, for climate. Uh, alongside that, passage of legislation uh, which looks uh, at uh, increasing the domestic production of semiconductors, a realization that uh, rebuilding America's own domestic industrial base in this regards is both a national security issue, but also a doorstep economic issue, uh, both for the jobs that it creates, but also to prevent these disruptions in supply chains that we've seen uh, in recent weeks. 
Uh, and what it points to is something that uh, one of our guests from last year, Politico's Nahal Tusi, uh, described as uh, omni policy that the Biden administration increasingly is operating from an assessment uh, that dividing policy into foreign and domestic uh, is not tenable, and that in fact policy will span both of those buckets. And that's something that rejuvenates America's domestic industrial base or its domestic capacity to produce hydrocarbons or to begin to develop green energy for the future uh, has geopolitical impacts, whether it reduces our dependence and the dependence of our allies upon authoritarian suppliers uh, or uh, removes a lever of bargaining and influence that those suppliers may have or seek to exercise over us uh, or our partners. So uh, as we're seeing uh, the emergence of these narratives coming together, particularly around, as we've been looking at in recent weeks, the notion of climate geopolitics as a driver for both foreign policy and domestic policy, uh, we've seen uh, the US take some major steps uh, since we were with you last uh, to enhance its capacity to do that. So while this has been happening domestically, what's been happening in the world and, and uh, what we are going to be looking at in our conversation with, uh, with Mohammed uh, momentarily is uh, sea changes uh, in uh, what's happening in the broader Indian Ocean Basin, East Africa, the Mediterranean, uh, a realignment that is occurring uh, starting and, and this notion as, as uh, Muhammad has coined of the Indo-Abrahamic corridor uh, from India through the Gulf, through Saudi Arabia, to Israel, to Egypt, down into East Africa, up into other parts of the Levant, and then across the Mediterranean uh, into Europe and North Africa. Uh, some fascinating developments that really haven't gotten a lot of coverage, but could have a real impact on uh, our own security and our own economy in years to come uh, as these new networks, or as Mohammed will point out, old networks that are really coming back again uh, in the 21st century uh, begin to take shape. And with that, let's turn now to our conversation with Mohammed Saleh. Mohammed, it's so uh, wonderful to have you with us here on the Doorstep podcast today. Uh, it's been not quite a month since uh, President Biden traveled to the Middle East, uh, and we're still seeing some of the uh, after effects uh, of, that, uh, of that visit. But one of the things that was really remarkable was that the presidential visit to the region highlighted, I think, for many Americans, uh, some of the dynamics, the changing dynamics that are occurring in the region, and particularly uh, the emergence of what you have termed uh, the Indo-Abrahamic uh, block, or in a more recent piece that you did for the national interest, the rise of West Asia, the idea that uh, India, looking westward, across the Indian Ocean, connecting to the Gulf Emirates, uh, and from there connecting uh, to Israel, to Egypt, to the Mediterranean, to Africa, uh, in a in a way that I think many Americans are not uh, are not particularly focused on. So perhaps uh, we could start our conversation by you discussing uh, the genesis of the Indo-Abrahamic concept uh, and why do you think it it may prove to be quite critical uh, in the months and years to come. Well, thank you, Nick. This is very kind of you to invite me uh, to the podcast. Let me start by saying, uh, as engineer by training, I have or I take issue with the current map of the Middle East uh, from a strategic uh, standpoint, but also from a culture slash civilizational slash economic uh, uh, point of view. Um, uh, Middle East is a very limiting, very fluid, uh, um, unnatural term that doesn't really mean anything in mean time. Uh, when we, uh, when when policymakers in Washington DC started to look at this region following 9-11 because of the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, the assumption was you have that sort of region from Morocco and the end of this map is somehow Iran. We don't know why, but this is the map that always exists in every single think tank 
in DC. But when you basically look into the map from that perspective, Iran is this big hegemon that's the end of the map. You add, this is by its own uh, uh, nature is flawed and doesn't really reflect uh, 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 the strategic, the geographical realities of the region, which basically means that you have India has always been part of that. New Delhi has always been part of that sort of system. Uh, centuries ago, under the um, uh, Muslim empires that spanned from um, uh, Damascus and Cairo and uh, Spain uh, to Delhi, the, the Emirates of Delhi. And on top of that, even the British uh, Empire was always uh, uh, seeing India as part of that sort of geoeconomic, geopolitical system. I mean, as someone who's born and raised in Cairo, one of the reasons that being told to us historically why Egypt was a Cubite, not only because of Suez Canal centrality to Europe and Asia, but mainly because the, uh, the Brits have seen it as integral part of their own imperial enterprise uh, system uh, that connects the Mediterranean, Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. So the whole idea of Delhi, Cairo, as part of encompassing something called, in my opinion, West Asia, is not really new. It's something that has always been there. However, uh, 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 post Second World War, Cold War, bipolar moment, polar, the, uh, the unipolar moment, I think made that sort of terminology uh, taking a backseat and just thinking about the region from a limiting standpoint. So that's my, my long spiel. Uh, to give you an idea about my intellectual roots or the intellectual roots of why I'm thinking about this region as West Asia encompassing what we call Middle East today, but also India, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, uh, Afghanistan, and Iran. And the moment we expand our views about this region, creating a pass of power, establishing a pass of power could be easier, right? Because the moment you only think about uh, uh, the restless Eurasian powers such as Iran, let's say, Turkey in, in, in its own sphere, in your mind, well, I mean, these are two rising Eurasian powers, uh, uh, creating any sort of balance of power around them could be difficult. Uh, uh, but the moment you, the moment you see that region from that perspective, I think it's easier to think about alignments, about alliances, about blocks, about coordination mechanism, about formats, about dialogues, you have a whole new possibilities that exist in, in this region. It does seem to be that, again, thinking about this as uh, a region that was artificially divided by American map making, so to speak, that we're going to create this Middle East with uh, essentially just deeming that to be a largely Arab Muslim construction. Not sure what to do with Iran as a uh, uh, Persian speaking, uh, and then kind of thinking of India only in, dire in the direction of, of China uh, does leave out the possibility of how this as an organic, as you said, geoeconomic region, geopolitical region uh, can in fact uh, serve uh, to be uh, part of you know, the, the transformation of global power that we're seeing. And, and I did remember reading something about uh, in discussing this, of saying, uh, when we think about this uh, Indo-Abrahamic corridor, West Asia, uh, whatever term is used, I know there's also now this uh, clunky bureaucratic term of I2U2 uh, as well that has been uh, circulating, uh, but that essentially you're taking uh, the dynamic uh, economic uh, potential uh, of India, linking it to uh, the resource and financial base uh, in the Middle East and in the, in the Gulf, in Saudi Arabia, uh, connecting it as well with uh, what we, you know, the resources and potential of, of East Africa, and then having an outlet uh, to, the, as you said, the Mediterranean through Egypt and Israel, and then adding the, the sort of technological connection. This would seem to be uh, a potential game changer for the way that the world might shake out uh, in coming years. Absolutely. Uh, um, and again, that system existed for centuries ago, right? That system was always there. Uh, the East, uh, I'm going to use uh, an Eastern term to describe the East. The East, all, the East always traded with each other, right? Muslim traders from Egypt, Oman, have always had access to Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, even some parts of Japan at that time. So that economic integration around the rimland, the literal states of Eurasia, has always been there. 
Um, I think uh, uh, the moment you introduced the Dutch uh, uh, India company and uh, the British India company, then things became different, became much more Western oriented, much more tied to geopolitics and geoeconomics, if you are. So what we're seeing right now is natural growth of that sort of system. It's happening organically uh, uh, through, as you said, um, uh, think about all the trade flow between the Gulf states and India. The massive uh, Saudi and uh, Emirati and Qatari uh, and Egyptian interests in investment in India, cooperating with India, not only, but to speak about trade, we speak about uh, 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 pharma, uh, uh, military cooperation, uh, tech cooperation. We recently have seen the uh, UAE and Israel investing in semiconductors in India. So that sort of integration is very is structural, is game changer. It's also, again, reflection of reality that has always existed. I think the moment people realize that we are pivoting to a multipolar system, uh, uh, because again, I come from a school of thought that I don't really believe a bipolar system was even natural system uh, for Ben Earth, right? I mean, when, you, when we're checking through history, uh, maybe Timon Lane, that was the last uh, global empire, emperor, right? But after that, we always had, before him and after him, we always have multi-civilizational powers. The system was, we always had multiple powers occupying different spheres. So right now we're back at that kind of understanding and realization. So nations are moving towards integration, towards cooperation, towards trying to pivot away from, from the West and, and, and Europe uh, from a structural standpoint. Because again, it's a reflection of geography, distance, demographics, trade, and, and, and also the whole idea that the East is on the rise. Um, uh, and power is already shifting to that direction. And as you said, just as you mentioned, that the semiconductor issue, which of course semiconductors have become uh, headline issues as people realize the question of dependence on supply chains that run through China, uh, concerns about uh, interruption of supply chains between China and Taiwan and, and the rest of the world, that uh, this actually opens up uh, the, the, the reemergence of these trading networks uh, opens up the alternative uh, Asian supply chain, so to speak, uh, that runs, uh, as you said, from Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, through India, uh, to the Gulf, uh, to Egypt and Israel, uh, into the Mediterranean, uh, and then from there to, to the transatlantic world. I mean, this, this would seem to be something that even if Americans aren't following it closely is something that could have uh, the, you know, the reemergence of these ties and the strengthening of these ties could have a real impact uh, on where Americans are sourcing uh, critical goods and services. Uh, do you see that, uh, have you seen any, uh, from, where you, from where you sit, uh, have you seen any uh, realization uh, in either American business circles or, or investors that this may in fact be, uh, you know, the, the dynamic growth area, or is this still, as you said, something limited largely to uh, the region itself? That is that the, the Emiratis, the Israelis, the Indians are doing this uh, and that the American uh, business community may just be somewhat on the sidelines. America is lucky. Uh, uh, why? Because here in America, there is, in my opinion, as an outsider from, from the way America works, is it has massive decentralized power system in a way that even if the diplomatic strategic uh, uh, community in DC thinking it is still stuck in the past, the tech and financial community in New York and California are way ahead. Uh, the Googles, the Facebooks, the, the, the Twitters of the word Teslas, they are at the forefront of this. Uh, when you look into the level of cooperation um, uh, and the initiatives that US uh, uh, tech companies uh, have been pursuing in these nations, I think in my mind, it's a, a practical realization of what we're talking about. Not really from a theoretical standpoint, not from a strategic standpoint, but they see something there. They're invested there. Uh, we see that in the way they're approaching, uh, for example, cable, uh, uh, the fact that you have the blue ramen coming from India, Saudi, Israel. I mean, this is basically the Google uh, uh, cable. It's a reflection of their own geopolitical and geographical understanding, which is, again, uh, 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 tells you and uh, tells you how uh, U.S. tech companies are understanding this in a in a faster pace uh, 
than uh, uh, some of our own friends and colleagues in DC. So I see, I don't really see America as a unified block when it comes to what's happening uh, 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 in, the, in the mainland, in uh, uh, the rimland. I, I think that there are some powers in America understand that, going through with it, uh, uh, embracing it. Uh, but also in DC, I think DC is is is, is uh, uh, keeping up with it. Is trying to keep up with it. The I2U2 is uh, 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 a game changer from that standpoint. Meaning, if you remember when I wrote that piece about the Indo Abrahamic almost a year and a half ago, the thesis was these three nations are going to build that. Right? It's going to be India, uh, UAE, Israel, but in the future we're going to have uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. And then we're going to expand that to the uh, East Mediterranean powers, Greece and France. Uh, that sort of system is going to be built naturally. And I didn't have the expectation that Washington would embrace it. But to their credit, they did. Why? It is a, 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 a strategic idea that solves uh, problems that uh, Washington has been grappling with. How to do more with less in West Asia. How to pivot uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, Indo-Pacific focus on Taiwan without really losing uh, uh, that level of strong relations and partnership that you have with West Asian nations. How can you also create a balance of power that we lost after the war in Iraq? I mean, let's be frank, that uh, in my opinion, uh, 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 one of the biggest reasons I see West Asia's unbalanced system is the war in Iraq. The invasion of Iraq is a strategic disaster that we're going to continue to pay its price every single year. And then once you lost Iraq and then you had the Syrian civil war, that whole system collapsed. You don't really have an East, like from my own, uh, as someone born and raised in Cairo, we call this the East, uh, Levant. Uh, it's an system, right? It became um, a, a, a region that's under direct influence of uh, uh, Iran and Turkey. And they themselves transformed to becoming much more transitional powers. Um, uh, so again, when you look into that kind of West Asia construct, it solves a lot of problems for, for Washington um, um, and the indo abrahamic as a baseline or a foundation for how America should uh, think about that region strategically and develop a strategy towards the region. Well, and you have already anticipated what my next question was going to be, which is that a somewhat sclerotic policy apparatus in Washington, which can be wedded to its geographic divisions and, and boundaries and the like is, is having to evolve. Um, your sense from the visit, of the, the presidential visit, the president's visit to the region, uh, if you have a sense, if you've been hearing things, uh, is this uh, concept, is this strategic vision beginning to percolate down? Uh, is there an understanding that uh, we have to be thinking? I mean, because one of my uh, concerns, again, also looking at this from the outside, has been uh, ever since we drew the lines that separated uh, from in the military combatant commands, India from Pakistan, where, where the CENTCOM, the Central Command ends and the Pacific Command begins, has always been to think of India in terms of China, India in terms of the Pacific, whereas this, con this construct also requires us uh, to think about India, in fact, as a player and force uh, in the Gulf, in the Levant, in East Africa, uh, and not as a sideshow, but as a strategic imperative for them. Do you see from what you're hearing um, from your perch that this concept is gaining greater traction and that people are willing in the policy world to, to work through the, the stovepipes that traditionally have segmented uh, these different parts of the world? That's a very, very tough question. One of the hardest questions that I, I got recently. Um, so a few weeks ago, I think late in July, we had a dialogue, a trilateral dialogue between India, the UAE, and France. So it's a, nothing really beyond that diplomats from these three nations are discussing tri, in a trilateral format. But again, when you think about the nations, it's India, uh, uh, South Asia, we're speaking about the UAE Gulf, and we're speaking about France, which also people think about France as just a European mainland country power. And again, we know when you look into the French, French empire footprint, it exists in East Africa, it exists in the Pacific, it exists in Latin America, it's a multi-theater power. So again, I think it's a reflection in Delhi, uh, 
that we are more than the Indo-Pacific. I mean, we are 1.4 billion people nation, uh, uh, a civilization. We are, uh, we have so much at stake when it comes to Indo-Pacific. We also have a lot at stake when it comes to the West of us, West Asia. We also uh, need to have a global vision as, a, a, as a, a power, a rising power that wants to present itself as a leader in the future, right? If the last 40 years were all about us waiting for the, for the rise of China, then the next 40 years, 50 years, is us talking about the rise of India uh, 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 as closer to reality, right? So I think that realization, the fact you have that sort of format uh, uh, that's aside from I2U2, like you have India part of uh, another dialogue with, uh, uh, um, with the UE and France, and then you have India increasing its own cooperation with Greece, which again, a country that's very focused entirely on its own sphere in the Balkans and the Mediterranean Sea, it gives you an idea that Delhi is shifting its own thoughts and ideas and also thinking in a much more broader geographical and geostrategic terms. Because again, it's a, it's a massive power, it's a rising power, and it understands it just can really focus entirely on a very small, uh, uh, immediate sphere of influence in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and countries are seeing India differently, right? I mean, the fact you have the NEA, the nearest affairs department at the State Department, thinking and, and working with Delhi on issues in West Asia and Middle East, uh, that's a big, big change. But I agree with you in terms of the problem that we have right now is the US military footprint divides the world in a very interesting way. That's, in my opinion, a post uh, Cold War. Uh, uh, the walk war understanding of geographies, which is very limiting. And I think it requires innovation. It requires that the uh, DOD needs to do some sort of geostrategic revision of these sort of lines. Because right now, let, let's talk about uh, East Africa, Horn of Africa, since you mentioned that. The biggest players in this region are Gulf nations. That's it, that, that, that's all what you need. From a financial, economic, geopolitical, security standpoint, these are the most influential powers that exist in East Africa. I mean, let's talk about the, the, the civil war in Ethiopia and the rule of uh, Turkey, UE, and Iran in that kind of region. So literally East Africa and Horn of Africa, uh, 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 we're, not swat, we're not speaking about China, we're not speaking about Russia, we're speaking about uh, uh, West Asian powers being much more dominant in that region. So how are we going to grapple with that question? How are we going to grapple with the question that in Azerbaijan, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia, you had Israel, UAE, uh, Iran, uh, uh, Turkey, very invested in, 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 this, uh, in this sort of conflict. So again, when you just think about it from a center command standpoint, you know, I mean, that these dynamics do not really make any sense. But when you also open up and you think about it from a strategic, a strategical, uh, a systematic, transoceanic uh, approach, I think it actually makes perfect sense. You're able to understand there is the mainland, there is the rimland, there is the connectivity, there is the old uh, traditional historical uh, 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 a system means, means waves of conflicts and cooperation at the same time. So when you think about system from conflict and peace standpoint, that all of that makes sense. And the, myth, the US military footprint doesn't reflect that understanding. And it, I hope uh, it will not take the US uh, shock uh, or a crisis to understand that. I hope so. And the problem in Washington is there is very limited strategic bandwidth uh, to think beyond the immediate threat, right? Uh, uh, let's be frank, here in Washington, Ukraine took all the air um, uh, from the room. And then when we had the Pelosi visit, Taiwan, it's basically war in Taiwan. We didn't even hear any sort of discussions about the Balkan uh, uh, situation. We, I don't remember uh, uh, hearing or reading that much about the Gronio Karabakh situation in the last few weeks. We just didn't, right? We, because we don't really have the strategic bandwidth to think beyond the big, strategic threats, which I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just saying uh, uh, we here in Washington, uh, people only respond to crisis, do not really think in a strategic uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 year approach, which also terrifying to some extent.
Yeah, no, that's a, that's a real issue that uh, we are not set up to deal with poly crisis. When you have multiple problems, each demanding attention, we, we like to focus, the established national security establishment is set up to focus on the crisis of the day. And this point about reactive, I think is also critical that um, we are not uh, set up to really shape environments as much as we are to respond to uh, the immediate the immediate issues and, and whether or not that changes or not, um, you know, will depend on you know what happens uh, in our in our own domestic uh, evolution. But no matter you know what happens in Washington, it, it sounds like what you've laid out here is that this is a process not started by the United States. It's a return to historical patterns that existed prior to the Cold War. Uh, it is driven by the the, the, the countries of the region, and that this is going to be a, a reality moving forward. Uh, there's one last point, if I can bring this in, uh, which is that, as, you know, it, which is, as you said, is the, you know, we, we talk about India, we talk about the UAE, and then, of course, has been uh, the position uh, and, and role of Israel. Uh, and Israel here, it, it seems, uh, again, as an outsider looking in, it seems that, you know, for many years, Israel positioned itself or tried to to make uh, uh, at least in, at least in the United States and in the West tried to, to really say we're an outpost of the West uh, in in this region uh, and it would seem that the indo-abrahamic concept essentially is Israel coming to terms with the fact that it too is a nation of the Levant and that it's rediscovering its uh, its position as a Levantine actor not as a European, Euro Western entity that was implanted into the Middle East. Uh, is that what you're seeing in terms of how uh, Israel's uh, uh, Israel is being received by, in, particularly in the Emir in the Emirates and elsewhere, uh, that this is Israel finally, in a way, embracing that it too is a Levantine uh, power and state. Uh, and what does this mean? Also, uh, is this a pathway forward? And and, and I. This may be a question that we can't answer, uh, that if Israel begins to really embrace itself as a Levantine state, uh, what does it mean for uh, a way out potentially for its uh, perennial uh, issue uh, with, with the Palestinians? Very, again, very um, tough question. And um, the moment that Israel moved from the European command to the center command, I think it was uh, fall 2021, just a few months ago. I think it's a realization that this is the case. It's a re realization on the strategic level that Israel should be seen not as an outpost, no as integral part of a broader defense architecture that exists in that region. And it seems also, again, Israel wouldn't have been moved or reassigned within the United States strategic thinking without Israel uh, uh, being consulted on that. So it's also an Israeli realization as well, because it's a need, it's a must uh, at this point. And it's also a reflection of a, a broader trend, which basically consolidation and alignment between US uh, uh, partners and allies in the region. Because beyond NATO, if you remember, beyond NATO, uh, uh, most of the US relations have always been bilateral, right? Uh, the Quad is relatively new thing, and you, we can argue that we all indebted to uh, uh, former, I'm sorry, for late Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for what he did in terms of embracing the, bringing a, a new strategic thinking, branding, uh, branding Asia Pacific as Indo Pacific, building this uh, uh, from a humanitarian uh, focused Quad to a, a balance of power, uh, security alignment in the Indo-Pacific. But beyond that, we, most of the United States relations uh, outside of NATO have always been, have always been bilateral. Uh, they were never through uh, 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 alignments, many alliances or coordination mechanism. So all what we have seen for the last five years is completely new, right? Having AUKUS with the Brits and the Australians, or let's embrace the I2U2 format. Let's talk about new different formats and alignments, including a, a defense uh, a format like the Najaf uh, Forum that includes the Abrahamic Accord Nations, Israel, uh, uh, the UE, Bahrain, Morocco, and the United States, and then the old uh, peace agreement signatories like Egypt. So that these sort of formats, completely new to United States thinking, 
actions and moves. Uh, so this is where this is how I see Israel. I see Israel as part of that kind of uh, new approach to deal with the new emerging global uh, threats that Washington is trying to deal with. So how we bring all our alliance in formats that make sense, that could be issue based, uh, could also be able to pivot or serve a broader strategic needs that Washington might need. I'm not saying that they are, or we're going to have a coalition of coalitions where all these coalitions serving a broader purpose of containing uh, China. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm saying it could help by the fact that taking away some of these military assets from the Middle East, West Asia to, uh, to Indo-Pacific is all what, what Washington wants. And this is, this is a win, this is a victory. So Israel is being seen from that perspective. Uh, uh, the second part, which also, again, I'm a, uh, I come from the really school of thought, um, um, uh, the Indo-Abrahamic uh, uh, was also a realization from, from the Gulf states and Israel that Israel might not be enough uh, alone, right? Uh, the, the Gulf and Israel, the Arab alignment, the, uh, the Abrahamic accord nations on their own, they're not maybe enough to create a balance of power. This is why expand the map and you bring India. And I think also this is something in the mindset of grand strategists in Tel Aviv. How can we also, us as a small nation, what 10, 15 million people can be part of a broader architecture because we also know that Washington is very distracted by a lot of broader strategic objectives. So we need to be part of something bigger. So this is how I, how I think that the, the, the Israeli thinking community or grand strategists are thinking about these kind of emerging questions. To your question about the Palestinians, I think uh, uh, we need a solution. And I know I'm not saying anything new. We need us. There is, there, is, there is a moral and realist uh, 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 case for finding a solution. I don't claim to be uh, an expert uh, uh, on, on the, the, the situation, but there must be a, 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 a solution from even a realist standpoint, because also that situation the more it continues, it also consumes Israel from a strategic standpoint, because you're always distracted, right? I mean, uh, for uh, like every every few months, you're always going to have the same issue, and also it's draining, and it, it 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 takes away from the political capital. It puts the strings on you and your own Arab alliance, right? Because it's not it's not easy. The more you integrate, but also the more they have leverage as well, and the question of public opinion would be much more important. So uh, I don't have a solution in mind by advocating that this situation needs to settled. And I think there's a lot of, like many proposals, you have the Arab Peace Initiative proposed by the Saudis back in 2001 or 2003, I, I can't really remember the date. And you have and you have the Abrahamic Accords nations pushing for it. So I think there is there should be a framework that Israel should embrace from a realist standpoint, not only from a moral standpoint, but moral and realist standpoint. Well, and that's a, a good way to uh, summarize some of the things we do at Carnegie Council that uh, it can be both a, from a realist perspective and from a moral perspective uh, to adopt uh, uh, policies of this type uh, by which uh, you recognize the power realize, realizations, but uh, you're also doing it uh, with an understanding of, of an ethical framework. So it's a nice tie back to uh, the work of the, uh, the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. Mohammed, I'd really like to thank you. This has been a a wonderful conversation. We've, we've really covered a lot here, and I think it will give our listeners, uh, many of whom I would wager have not really thought about India, the UAE, and Israel being in the same place, geostrategically speaking, geoeconomically speaking, uh, because of the way in which uh, we have our mental maps of the world, but also why this matters uh, and how this is an emerging development uh, so thank you for walking us through this. Thank you for uh, really uh, giving us a sense uh, of the dynamics uh, at play. Uh, and we'll, as these uh, uh, events progress, uh, we'll certainly want to have you back on uh, in the future to, uh, to give us an update on where things are headed. Nick, such a pleasure. And thanks so much for inviting me. I really enjoyed the conversation back and forth. You are such a... Uh, an important uh, uh, intellectual in the space and that was such an honor. Thanks for listening to The Doorstep, sponsored by the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. For more, go to carnegiecouncil.org. Stay healthy and safe.